Can you, can you hear me? I'm a little bit worried. I can't get close to the, to the podium and the microphone because below me is this ferocious rabbit in a hat down here. <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Mark Frankel, and I am on staff here at AAAS, and I want to welcome you to the fourth in our 2014 series on neuroscience and society. As I suspect you already know, that's tonight's topic with a focus on the science of illusion, and we have a somewhat different program planned for you than uh, has been the case in the past for those of you who have been here before. I do want to make something very clear if it isn't already, and I suspect if any of my staff are here tonight, it probably is already, but I'm the least important person who will be on this stage tonight, and uh, we have a really good program uh, planned for you. Uh, before we get into those details, I want to acknowledge that this is a part of a, the series on neuroscience and society is a collaboration between AAAS and the Dana Foundation, and I want to acknowledge uh, officials from the foundation are here this evening, and I want to welcome them as well. Uh, the event is also being uh, videocast, not live, but videocast so that it will be posted on the Dana Foundation website probably within 10 days or so, that's typical, uh, for others to view it or for you to view it again to see what you thought you may have seen the first time but really didn't. We'll see how that goes. Um, hopefully you've picked up a program for tonight. Uh, notice we've taken the liberty of not doing our usual um, purple and black. We've done black and orange uh, in, in recognition of Halloween which seems like a good occasion to uh, consider what's happening in the brain when we are experiencing an illusion. Um, we have, I think, several people on the program who are going to help us explain those things. Please note that in your program there are detailed bios so that my introductions, uh, while I hope uh, will give you a feel for who they are, uh, won't do as much justice uh, for the sake of time as these, as these uh, bios. Uh, if you turn to the page which lists the speakers and then starts the bios, uh, you'll notice that uh, their program lists a Stephen Melnick as one of our speakers. That's just an illusion. You think it's a typo, but it's really just an illusion. Uh, it's uh, Stephen Macknick, whose name is spelled correctly on the next page, and we apologize to Dr. Macknick for that uh, oversight on our part. So we're going to begin the program. Uh, with a performance by one of the leading international illusionists, Alain New, who has been challenging audiences uh, for years to consider the powers of the mind. And he's performed before many different audiences. I'm not quite sure any of them are of the type that we have here this evening, but uh, we'll see. And one Washington Post reporter who actually saw one of his performances wrote that he will leave audiences asking, how did he do that? And if that happens here, I'm hopeful that some of the clinicians and scientists who will join him on the uh, stage after his performance will help us answer some of those questions. Um, after his performance, I will come up to the podium, invite the other speakers to join him up here on the stage. I'll then formally introduce the other speakers and give you a sense of how we're going to proceed in terms of your participation uh, as well and then the reception that will follow. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Alain New. Well, it is my great pleasure and honor to be here this evening to perform for all of you uh, distinguished men and women of the uh, uh, scientific community here in Washington, D.C. My name is Alan New. I go by the man who knows, and I know right about now many of you there in your seats are probably asking yourselves, so just what is it that this man who knows knows? And that's a good question. I would expect nothing less from the men and women of the greater Washington metropolitan scientific community. I might expect differently from elsewhere. But uh, I actually am, though, originally from the far east side of the Bay Area in California, uh, do consider myself a Washingtonian. In fact, I uh, just this past summer was just saying that I am so DC that I have no AC. <laughs> I am so DC that when I go incognito, I like to call myself John Smithsonian. 
fact, I am so DC, I know that all of this stuff that you guys call science is nothing but Freemasonry. <laughs> Don't pretend like it's not true. I'm so DC, I live in the suburbs. I'm so DC, when I eat Vietnamese, I go to Arlington. <laughs> so, I know that you guys are not here and we haven't filled this place up in order for you to hear these provincial proclamations of mine, nor did you actually come here in order to you know, necessarily hear the latest and greatest of all the sub-stages of the fascinating uh, mitocyte, whatever you call it, the, uh, the, the, uh, the stuff that ends up uh, infecting the neuroendocrine systems in, in what we do. Now, the truth of the matter is, is that what I'm about to do is, will involve something that involves just your own centeredness, your own ability to be centeredness. In order to kind of get this centeredness, I need you all to just participate in this very simple thing. I want you to notice that underneath your palms, you'll find that there are these things, they call them bracelets, palm readers call them bracelets. They should be right underneath your palms, uh, distinguishing between your hands and your wrists. What I want you all to do at this point is to just uh, put your hands together so that you're forming one continuous line with your bracelets on both wrists. And now, making sure that those bracelets stay together so that your both hands are completely aligned, you're just going to kind of come around like this and then kind of come up to a prayer position. At this point, look at your middle longest fingers, and you'll probably note that one of them is slightly longer than the other. I want you to take note of which one is longer, which one is shorter, and then hold up the hand that has the shorter finger. Okay, and now, if you'll just simply stare directly into the palm of your hand, I want you to imagine that there's a bright white light coming right out of the center of the palm of your hand using your best imagination possible. Imagine that white light is shining out of the center of your hand and as you look at it, you realize it's a white line of energy that goes down your brain, through your shoulder, up your arm, through that white light in the center of your palm, up into the sky through your middle finger. Take a deep breath, blow towards your palm and imagine that white light disappearing. That's all it takes. At this point, I want you to just take your hands and match up your uh, lines once again, your bracelets once again. Come back up here, bring your hands back up. Take a look at your index, your middle fingers. At this point, you should probably notice that your fingers have grown to match up your other finger or possibly even longer. How many of you actually did experience that just now? Raise your hand if you did actually experience right, that right now. And look at that, I'd say we had about 80, 85% of you. Give yourselves a big round of applause. Now, <laughs> if you do that every single day for the rest of the week, you will actually be able to extend your fingers up to about six to eight inches in length. <laughs> and no, it doesn't happen with other parts of the body either. Now, when you think about this, the truth of the matter is, is that uh, you might consider that what I did just now was psychologically impress on you to somehow stretch out your finger the second time you went through that exercise. The fact of the matter is, though, is that I didn't actually ask you to do that. You used your own powers of the mind to do that yourselves. So to continue along with this thought, I'm, I'd like to say that with regards to the art of illusion and delusion, the way I like to approach it is it's a little bit different from most people who are within this field and industry. Um, most people who are within this field generally, just like scientists, don't believe that uh, that stuff actually exists. They believe that it's some sort of a deception or some sort of a, a, a method that is designed to deceive our senses. So um, I'll tell you what, so let's try a little demonstration that involves our senses, if we will. Happen to have here. Pardon me. I'm going to move this up to the front so that you guys can see. Uh, what do you get when you take an East Indian sage and put him for a month in a tribe of Inuit Eskimos? A frozen yogi. Okay. <laughs> Let's see here. I happen to have here a uh, couple of cups of ice, which I will separate out just like this. 
And we also have a can of Coke. You're about to see the chemical contents of Coca-Cola as it mingles with a little bit of ice. Now when I say you experience this, what I'm saying is that you see and you hear the substance poured into the glass, but you don't actually get to experience anything more than that. It's really just sight and hearing that's doing that job for you. In other words, if I were to just focus here on this can, you might experience me bending the metal of this can, or is it you experiencing my mind causing my muscles to contract? That might be it. So here's the thing. We're going to need a couple of people from the audience to help me out up here on the stage. A couple of people who can actually give the full experience of all five senses. Um, let's see. Who would like to sacrifice themselves in the name of science to come up here and uh, be involved in this little? OK, we've got a gentleman over here. What is your name? Chris. Chris, OK. And let's have one more fellow. Uh, anybody else? Over here. Sorry? Come on up, let's give them both a big round of applause. Excellent. Come on up. Chris, thank you very much for jumping up and volunteering. Where is this gentleman coming up from? And your name is? Steven. Steven. Gentlemen, please take these cups. And I want you to first of all smell. Does it smell like the substance in question? Go ahead, taste. Does it taste like the, quest, the, the substance in question? Yes? Go ahead, drink up the entire contents, if you will. Go ahead, and I know that uh, you'll want to do this quickly, as we don't want to prolong the show any more than it needs to be. But uh, go ahead and imagine yourselves completely consuming the rest of the remainder of the contents of what we were talking about. At this point, we have Coca-Cola and ice. And that's all you feel, right? You feel it coming down your esophagus. You feel it collecting in your bellies, right? Go ahead and finish up the rest of it. <laughs> because that is the full experience. The full experience is seeing, hearing, but then also smelling, tasting, and feeling. And you definitely feel that ice, the coldness of the ice inside of yourselves right now, right? Good. Now here's where the illusion begins. The illusion happens with how we understand perception. So for instance, if we were to like just focus on this can once again, and I just want you to imagine what it would look like if this can were to no longer be crushed. What it would sound like if somehow this can were to somehow buckle outwards. Until this can somehow, once empty, starts to refill itself slowly all the way up to the top until the can literally becomes completely sealed. And that is to say, completely sealed. <laughs> and I know how the two of you must be so parched <laughs> after this little demonstration. So I'll tell you what, if you can just uh, take that back to your seats and enjoy the rest of your show, give them a big round of applause. <laughs> so, it's very interesting, right? And what's interesting about the art of deception is that sometimes we just don't know. Where does it actually change over into real, something real, something genuine. In fact, um, the thing that magicians like to do, in fact, I'd say that probably the better guys that are out there that you might see on television, is they, they, instead of showing you something that involves elaborate props and lots of stage assistance and stuff like that, generally they try to show you something that involves something ordinary, something that just involves a simple 
ordinary thing. I brought a couple of things for show and tell. This looks like an ordinary stick, but really, it's actually an East Indian talking stick. It's a, it's a stick for storytellers to essentially grab the attention of the people around them. Ordinary things are interesting because people recognize what those things are. In fact, um, I happen to have picked this up on the way in. This is a spoon, and it's an ordinary spoon. Now, I realize that the second I say ordinary, this veil of skepticism descends among you. That's OK. We'll have somebody come up and volunteer. Let's see if we can get somebody to volunteer. How about some, this woman over here in the middle? What, what is your name here? Yeah. Jen. Jen? Come on up, Jen. Let's give her a big round of applause. This will be perfect for her. Excellent, excellent. I have here a table. I have here a spoon. And I have, it's Jennifer? Yes. Jennifer, thank Hi. you very much for jumping up and volunteering. Now, you had no idea that I was going to have you participate in this oh. particular demonstration. That's good. That's important. I'd like you to go ahead and have a seat right over here. And Jennifer, examine this spoon. Make sure it's just an ordinary spoon to your satisfaction and expertise. Stainless steel, yes? And what we'll try is something kind of interesting because what we try to do is show you how you can take something ordinary like that and show you something extraordinary about it. So the first thing I'm going to have you do is I'll tell you what, if you could just take this pen. Be careful. It's a Sharpie. And I want you to just write your initials in the center of the bowl of the spoon. OK? How about, uh, uh, and, then, and then above your initials, how about uh, triple A-S, OK? OK. OK, triple A-S. And then underneath your initials, Dana, OK? okay. And then underneath all that, 2014. Wow. <laughs> OK, so we've now given the spoon some character. It's always going to remain consistent. I'm not going to use sleight of hand to change or switch the spoon in any way. I'll take the pen back. Okay. That's how I got it to begin with. And now, Jennifer has written her initials in the center of the spoon. I'm not sure if you can see that there, but her initials, the initials AAA S, Dana, and 2014. Now, you're right-handed? Yes. Turn towards me, hold your right hand out flat if you would. Place your left hand directly on top and hold your hands just like this. Keep your eyes closed at this point, OK? Now, I'm going to touch your hands very, very lightly. I want you to count how many times I touch your hands. But don't count out loud. Just count to yourself, all right? Are you ready? Take a deep breath first, and then we'll begin. If you feel me touch your hands at all, I just want you to count to yourself. Each time you feel me touch or tap your hands, you're counting to yourself. Each time you feel touch, a tap, a shock, anything at all, you're counting. Are you counting at this point? Keep counting. Are you still counting? OK, keep counting. And open your eyes. Jennifer, how many times did you feel me touch your hands? Nine. Nine times. So top and bottom in different places. Yes. You really felt? Yes. Nine times. Yes. How many times did you see me touch your hands? OK, close your eyes again, OK? Keep your eyes closed. I'm going to hold one hand on top, one hand below. When I count to three, you'll push your palms together. One, two, three. Pushing your palms together. Do you feel the spoon pushing upwards against the top of your hand, the top hand of your two? Yeah. Yes? A little bit more now? Possibly. <laughs> All right, open your eyes. Now that spoon has been between her hands the entire time. I didn't touch it at all. It's been signed by you so that we know that it's always the same spoon. But hold your hands like this and just bring it apart. Let's take a look at the spoon at this point where, and what it looks like now. Go ahead and just take a look. And as you can see, look, the spoon has actually bent a good inch off the surface of the palm. Now I realize it's, you know, it, not really a drastic bend, but considering I didn't touch her at all, you have to admit, it's pretty good, right? 
I know you want to physically see this take place, so look, I'm going to just place this right here on my hand and watch. And as you can see, the spoon will continue to droop and continue to droop until that spoon droops like a wilted flower. Now tug on the end like a wishbone. I mean, that's pretty difficult to unbend, right? It's not made of solder. It's not made of any kind of cheap metallic substance. It's a stainless steel spoon, right? I mean, the fact is that you could probably with muscle, I mean, physically, let me do this, physically unbend the spoon using muscle. But let's try something that would be humanly impossible, or at least seemingly so. Rather than bringing that energy outwards, let's imagine that energy spiraling inwards. Watch. And now you'll see, Jennifer, that this spoon is actually twisted about 90 degrees around <laughs> at the neck, right? Yeah. Creating that kind of permanent Linda Blair effect. Okay. <laughs> Here, I'll tell you. I knew I'd be able to get you on that age demographic for that one. <laughs> All right, so I'll tell you what. Um, take a look. Try to untwist that, okay, while I uh, douse my head here. I mean, that's pretty difficult to untwist, right? <laughs> she's like, she, she's like, uh, I can't do it. Here's the thing, it's a very light touch, like this, watch. And ultimately what you end up with is what somebody might call an impossible object. Basically an object that once people hear the story behind it, they say, that's impossible. But given the fact that you actually got to examine the spoon and write your initials on the spoon before it went through its transformation sort of helps to raise the question of just what is impossible anyway. So with that, please keep that as a special souvenir, okay? Thank you very much for coming up and volunteering. Let's give Jennifer a big round of applause. Crazy, huh? So, very, very interesting. Powers of the mind, illusions, and that sort of thing. Let's continue this with, uh, with talking about whether or not it's possible to read someone's mind, okay? In fact, um, we have a couple of guests from out of town who are with us today, I believe Steve and Susanna. Would you mind standing up for a second? Let's give them a big round of applause. Now, where did you guys come from? From, from where? From Brooklyn, all the way down from, from, from New York. If you wouldn't mind come on, coming on up here and helping me with something, let's give them a round of applause as they uh, help me out with something. I want to show you something kind of interesting, if you would. It's really, really my pleasure to meet both of them. It's, uh, I, I know that they're very, very good friends of a very close friend of mine, Apollo Robbins, who happens to be one of the world's most amazing pickpockets, right? And, uh, and, and this guy actually, worked with me at Caesars Palace for a number of years back in the early 2000s. And uh, since then, he's become the, uh, the prestidigitator extraordinary of Brain Games, the television show. If you've ever seen the magician on Brain Games, that would be Apollo, right? right. Now, what I'd like you, the two of you to do, actually, is I happen to have here a couple of things. And in the spirit of Halloween, uh, I should say October, which happens to be my favorite month, I always get gifts. People always give me gifts, and I happen to have three gifts over here that I got, uh, and, uh, and we're gonna try to show you something that involves this. If you wouldn't mind, um, uh, go ahead and take those envelopes and just kind of mix them about. I've essentially made sure that they're basically all mixed up and about. And go ahead and however way you like, okay? Excellent. And what I'd like you to do, Susanna, is, is help me out if you would, and, and are you right-handed or left-handed? Okay, with your right hand, I want you to pick up, uh, uh, we'll do this for a little process of elimination, pick up any one of those envelopes. And with your left hand, pick up a different one. Good? And just set those over to the side, if you would. 
Actually, here, hand them to me, hand them to me. Because this is the process of elimination. The elimination process was to essentially leave you with this uh, prize over here. Because I happen to, well, I want to show you what I have, have over here. In the spirit of Halloween, a couple of different people had gotten me some gifts. And um, I wanted to see if this actually worked. Because oftentimes, synchronicities take place in the most unusual ways. Oh, look at this. This is one of my favorite books. And this is actually the J. Lee illustrated version of Dracula. And uh, here, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll let you display that in one of your hands. Let's see if I look into this one. Oh, yes. This was the other gift that I had. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. That's fabulous. But the weird thing is that through this process of elimination, they ended up with this one over here. Of all of them, I had the strange feeling that they would end up with this particular gift. Because this gift came to me from Richard Restack. And it happens to be the book that they wrote, Slights of Mine. I think that they both deserve a big round of applause. Thank you very much for helping me with that. Oh, but before you leave, before you leave, let me try, let me, let me uh, just make sure of something. If you just kind of flip through the pages there, would you say that that is definitely the book that you wrote? It is. Looking at that? Absolutely. Let's try this, okay? I'm just going to kind of flip through the pages, and I want you to just go ahead and call stop at any time, Susanna. Stop. Okay, now do you want me to stop there or do you want me to keep going? That's up to you. Stop. Keep going or keep, or stop there? Yeah. Okay, I want you to take the book and Let's look at just the first four lines of the top of the page that you're on, okay? And imagine those first four lines, but then now just look at the first four words at the very first, at the very uh, beginning of each line. And find one word that kind of sticks out to you. Do you have one? Yes. Okay. Now this isn't like a, this isn't like a word like the or something like that, is it? Okay, good. Concentrate on it and get it clearly in your thoughts. I'm feeling that this is actually a word, and here's the thing. How many pages are in that book? Do you know? Uh, you don't even know. Uh, 291. 291 pages in that book. Approximately about 48 lines per page. 12 words per line. If you were to add up all of those words in every single one of, in that entire book, how many words would that actually be? Give or take 100, we're talking dozens, dozens of words <laughs> in that book. And you were thinking of one. The word that you're thinking of, if you say it in your mind, just say it in your mind. It's, it's not two syllables, is it? I'm sorry? You want to hand it to him and see if it works with him? Here, I'll tell you what. As I just go through, just call stop at any time, OK? Stop. OK. Will you take this uh, at this point? And concentrate on the, uh, I'll tell you what. Just imagine on the page that you're on, imagine just uh, the first word written on that page, OK? It's not like a the or something like that, is it? No. OK, hold on. <laughs> I'm sensing that this is a name, am I right? Correct. And I'm sensing that this is, um, this is a name of a, a famous person, am I right? Yes. This is a name of a famous um, person whose name is like Jim or James. Hold on. No, his name is not James. It's James? It is. James the Amazing Randy? My best friend, skeptic, James the Amazing Randy, thank you very much for helping me out. Thank you very much as well. And uh, I'll tell you what, please take this back with you. And would you please sign this for me? That was really the real reason why I wanted them to do that. <laughs> Mind reading. Is it possible for other people to read other people's minds? Now, the truth of the matter is that when we actually read our minds, when, we, when people read other people's minds, it usually doesn't happen on purpose. It usually happens by accident. You're washing the dishes, you're vacuuming. Something ends up happening that ends up amazing you later on when you realize that it actually came true. Let's try something that will involve that kind of sense of mind reading. Because sometimes people, I would say a lot of psychologists generally will think that mind reading has something to do with facial expressions or reading the way someone might be thinking by looking at their body language. 
what I think is much more interesting than that is when it actually happens in our subconscious, when it happens when zero observation takes place whatsoever. So to move this along a little bit further, let's bring a couple of people up here on the stage who I have yet to meet, okay? Um, oh, we have a woman all the way in the back. What is your name? Heather. Heather, okay, come on up. Heather, let's give her a big round of applause. And um, let's see. Would you mind coming on up as well? Yes? All right, perfect. Heather, and your name over here is? Chandler, Chandler and Heather, thank you very much for coming on up. Thank you very much for jumping up and volunteering. Now, before I asked for volunteers, you had no idea that I was gonna be picking on you, did you? Correct. And did you have any idea? Okay, did you have a psychic feeling? I wanted to. <laughs> well, perfect, in that case. I'm going to have you both have a seat over here in these two chairs so you can be completely comfortable. Do the two of you know each other by chance? Heather, meet Chandler. Chandler, meet Heather. The two of you are going to be the team. The first thing that I'm going to ask is, have you ever been hypnotized before, ever? No. Never. No. Never even tried it. Correct. Yoga or meditation? I think I've tried it. Okay. You? Okay, well, let's see if this works. If you wouldn't mind putting your, uh, your uh, uh, program underneath your chair for the time being, sit up real tall in your chairs facing the audience, and if you would, just make sure that uh, your heads are aligned with your spine so you're facing forward. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to take you through a little visualization process. I want you to know that during that process, I'm not going to humiliate you or embarrass you in any way. So what I want you to do is just, um, is just just be relaxed and be uh, aware at all times. Imagine, if you would, in your mind's eye, all you see are clouds billowing forth. In a couple of seconds, I'm going to have you take a deep breath. And in fact, when I count to three, take a deep breath and imagine blowing those clouds away. One, two, three. Breathe in, breathe out. Imagine blowing those clouds as they part. Up ahead, you see a staircase. Those stairs lead upwards. Imagine yourselves walking towards those stairs, looking up the stairs, and then walking up the stairs. With each step you take up the stairs, your body becomes more and more relaxed. Each step you take up the stairs, your body becomes more and more relaxed until you reach the very top. When you reach the top step, imagine yourselves approaching a doorway. Imagine yourselves continuing to climb the stairs until you get to that door. Imagine yourself stepping through the door, allowing the door to shut behind you. You find yourself in a dark hallway, but up ahead you see some light. Imagine yourself at this point getting up walking towards that light, allowing it to get larger and larger, brighter and brighter. And then you realize it's a spotlight hanging down from the ceiling, casting a pool of light on the floor in front of you. Imagine yourselves at this point stepping into that spotlight, and when you do, you will see each other. So Chandler sees Heather on one side, Heather sees Chandler on the other side. They shake hands in the center of the spotlight just as they did at the very beginning. Take one step backwards out of the spotlight. Have a seat in those two chairs conveniently located behind your imagination. And now, keeping your eyes closed this entire time, I want your bodies to feel completely sensitized and aware. So every single thing you feel, I want you to take note of. If you feel me tap you or touch you, stay completely still. Just count how many times you feel me tap you or touch you, where it is on your body you feel me tap you. If I'm going to take a feather, brush it across your face, stay completely still. Just count how many times you feel that feather brush you across the face, roughly where it is across the face you feel me brush that feather. But first, let's focus on the tapping because I just tapped one of you. Raise your left hand if you felt tapped. Now with your left hand, please point to the area of your body that you felt tapped on. And with your left hand, please hold up the number of fingers that correspond to how many times you felt me tap you there. Very good, place your left hand down. Now let's focus on the brushing the feather across the face. Raise your left hand if you felt a brush across the face with a feather. Now with your left hand, please point to the area of your face you felt brushed on. And with your left hand, please hold up the number of fingers that correspond to how many times you felt me brush you there. Place your left hand down. I want you to imagine yourselves at this point getting up out of your chairs. You're walking back down the hall the way you came, all the way back down towards those doors. As you get right up to those doors, imagine yourself stepping through and finding yourself at the top platform of the staircase looking down. Imagine yourselves descending the stairs. With each step you take down the stairs, your body becomes more and more aware of the people looking upon you, shifting around in front of you. When I clap my hands, you'll both open your eyes. Tonight, you'll have the deepest, soundest sleep you've had in a very long time. Are you ready?
Open your eyes, give them a big cheer. They were good, huh? <laughs> Stay right where you are for the time being, okay? Because what was I talking about at the very outset? I was saying you can't actually read someone's mind, you know, like a book. You can't look at someone and say, you're thinking exactly this. However, at times, usually when you least know it, you can kind of get a feeling that of something that somebody else might be feeling or sensing in that moment. In fact, just like all of you can right now look into their faces and see for yourselves that um, they have no idea what just took place. <laughs> so let's talk to them and see what was on their mind. Now, Heather, did you feel hypnotized at all during that process? No. How about you, Chandler? No. No. Interesting. But during this process, you felt me uh, uh, tap you on what part of the body? Do you remember? My right shoulder. Your right shoulder. You remember that. And how many times? Twice. Twice on the right shoulder. And you felt? Yes, the same. Twice on the right shoulder. Yes. Interesting. Now I followed that up by taking this feather and brushed you across what part of the uh, face? Nose. Nose. How many times? Once. once. And you felt once as well? Yep. Interesting. In fact, what's interesting about this to all of them is that during this process I did actually take my finger and I tapped you twice on the right shoulder and then I followed that up by taking this feather and brushed you once across the nose, Heather. The Chandler. <laughs> With you, I did no such thing. Wow. Yeah. Am I right? I think they both deserve a big round of applause. Thank you very much for jumping up and volunteering. Thank you so much, Heather and Chandler. Ladies and gentlemen, you can return back to your seats. Crazy, huh? Well, listen, I just want to say that you guys have been a terrific audience. It's been really fun, a lot of fun performing for all of you. We have a, a really amazing uh, Q&A, uh, or I should say a panel discussion that will be taking place in just a couple of minutes. But before that, can I show you one final little demonstration that will be kind of, in of interest to all of you? I want you to imagine, well, first of all, would you believe it if I were to say that um, our minds can affect our bodies in such a way to actually affect our heartbeats, our physiology, our pulse rates, our general makeup? Would you believe that that's true? You, you might say maybe, maybe not, but the fact is, is that it is true. It's true that we can actually do that, and what I'm going to do is show you that we can do that not just at any moment, but right now. And the way we're going to do this is, well, I guess since we have scientists and a lot of physicians in the room, I think it's, this is gonna be easy. I want you to just uh, take your fingers and find your pulse on your wrist. And take a moment to do that. If you feel hardcore, you can use your neck. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but as you start to feel your pulse there beating, I'm going to have you go ahead and make a noise, either with your mouth, like a clicking noise, or with your foot as you stomp it against the, uh, against the floor, and just kind of stomp that, not yet, but you know, when I say now, I'm gonna have you go ahead and just feel that pulse and make a noise that is rhythmic to the pulse that you individually feel. We're gonna do this all at the same time, so are you ready? On your mark, get set, go. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Now that was complete pandemonium as far as I was concerned, okay? It's chaotic, it's uh, beautifully random, but you know, that's the beautiful thing about science, is that science shows us is that what, what seems completely random usually has some sort of underlying pattern behind it. And so what we're going to try to do is uh, see if we can somehow connect our thoughts right now. In fact, if I can get all of you to just close your eyes, and imagine inside your mind's eye just your beating heart. And imagine yourself just floating there and imagine your beating heart just beating there for a moment. And I'll just uh, describe to you in a moment that just behind the breastbone of your body is an area which I call your spiritual heart. This is the area in which all happiness and your fulfillment wishes actually come from. This is the source of all of the happiness and wisdom and love that people search for throughout their entire lives, and yet it's right there, right behind our breastbones, right in the center of our bodies. And this particular furnace, energy furnace, if you will, can actually connect with other people, 
places and things around you just by simply focusing on it. What I'm going to have you do is just take a deep breath right now and imagine your heart beating and imagine it contracting and expanding and then radiating these iridescent beams of light that will completely engulf and bubble out around the people, making them completely present and completely among us, okay? Take a deep breath, and as you exhale, make a wish, if you like, a wish that you believe will come true, and open your eyes. That was good, was, do you feel refreshed? At this point, I want you to go ahead and, uh, well, answer this one question, first of all. What did the guy, what did the Zen Buddhist say to the guy at the hot dog stand? Make me one with everything. You see, so we're already beginning to get this, where you're already feeling what I'm feeling right now. I want you at this point to go ahead and get your pulses once again. And once you can feel your pulse, I want you to go ahead and stomp your foot, make a noise when I count to three. One, two, three. You feel it? I feel a rhythm actually happening at this point. I think you should give yourselves a big round of applause. And I would like to say right now, thank you again for the pleasure and honor of having me come out here and experience this scientifically proven telekinetic moment with me. In just a few moments, we'll be continuing on with a panel discussion. Please stay tuned. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. <laughs> that was a great way to get okay, that. Okay, uh, while they're getting their uh, microphones off, let me just tell you how we will proceed uh, and then introduce the, the three additional presenters. You need the microphone. Uh, but first, I have just, uh, I've been asked to make sure that everyone understands, particularly those of you who were volunteered and came yeah. up on the stage, the that this is being videoed and that this will appear on the Dana Foundation website uh, as a video in maybe 10 days or so. So we wanted to make sure that your comfort level was such that you understood uh, that. And if you have any kind of issues with that, if you'd see me afterwards uh, before the reception, I'd appreciate that. Uh, so um, in a moment, they're all going to sit down. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, a very basic question of the uh, th other three speakers. Please have a seat whenever you're ready. And uh, then they're going to carry on their conversation, hopefully without my help. At some point, maybe about 20 minutes to the hour, I'll come back up and we'll, we'll shift from the conversation up here to get all of you engaged with your questions. Uh, you can certainly ask, how did you do that? I'd be interested in having the answer as well, <laughs> or, or whatever it is, but I just want to indicate to you that at that point, we'll only have a certain amount of time before the reception begins, so please make your questions as succinct as possible, and if it's directed to a particular speaker, uh, please uh, let them know. So let me introduce uh, those who have joined us on the stage, again, reminding you that your, your program has their bios. Uh, it's, it's interesting when, when, when reading these bios, these are not the typical bios that I encounter when I go to scientific meetings or even science and society kinds of meetings. So um, I can't help but introduce Richard Restack, who is sitting next to Elaine Nu. Um, he is a, please go ahead. He's a clinical professor of neurology at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences and is a member of the International Brotherhood of Magicians and the Order of Merlin, awarded after 25 years of consecutive service to the 
International Brotherhood of Magicians. I've never had a chance to say that before, so thank you very much. He also maintains a private practice in neurology and neuropsychiatry, so he is, in a sense, sort of our clinician up here. And then we have uh, two more basic scientists uh, who I'm pleased to introduce, uh, Stephen Magnick, who is immediately to uh, my left, and Susanna martinez Conde, who is to his left. And they are professors in ophthalmology, neurology, and physiology and pharmacology at SUNY uh, Downstate Medical Center in New York City. Uh, they're founders of a new discipline of neuromagic, and they've published over 170 articles in academic journals that many of you will be familiar with. Uh, but they are also illusions columnists for the scientific American mind, and I'm not quite sure whether that means you're an illusion, the column is an illusion, or is the scientific American mind an illusion? Anyway, I'm sure you'll figure that out and let us know. And you've already been introduced to their book, Slights of Mind, What the Neuroscience of Magic Reveals About Everyday, Our Everyday Deception. So, uh, with that, I'm going to ask um, our two basic scientists and our clinician to answer this question for us. What exactly happened during that performance? What did we see? What did we think we saw? And then, uh, Elaine, I'd be happy for you to respond to whatever they have to say. So let's get started. S Stephen, would you go first? Sure. Make sure your, your mic's on. Your, all your mics are on. OK. So what we saw was um, what we always see. We saw a simulation of reality in our minds. What you are is a bunch of neurons in your brain. And your neurons are little sacks of salt water, and they make networks. And there's electrochemical synapses or signals flowing through those networks. And in a subset of neurons in your brain, uh, those, th that set is the neurons that are responsible for creating the simulation of reality that's outside of you. And that, that, that subset of neurons gets information from your eyes and your ears and your cognitive processes, cause and effect, memories, and all of those things come together to create the simulation of the world outside that you interact with. And that's the only thing you've ever interacted with. You've never actually interacted directly with the world, right? It can't possibly be. And so what Alain has done is he's taken some of this information, which is already quite sparse, and we'll, I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about that a little later, uh, and, and taken the information that your, your brain is using to create this simulation and tweaked it a little bit in ways that you weren't expecting, which is why you were able to create things in this simulation of reality, which is your life, uh, that aren't quite correct. And so that is what magic is, that's what illusions are, and that's why everything is to some extent illusory. What happened here on stage and what happened in your brains are not the same thing. The way that you perceive reality, as Steve indicated, doesn't match perfectly the reality that is out there. We almost never have 100% correspondence even in everyday life. We, our brain fills in a lot of gaps, takes shortcuts, makes assumptions, and magicians, all artists, take advantage. They're artists that are um, very good observers and manipulators of human perception and behavior, but among artists, magicians are special because they're masterful manipulators of our attentional and cognitive processes. So all of these loopholes that are in our brains, that uh, the ways in, we, in which we tend to fill in reality that have served an evolutionary purpose over the years, and that these are adaptations that we use generally to survive better in the world, these loopholes, magicians take advantage of them to create a reality that is drastically different of what is actually happening. So magicians, in a sense, are not really tricking us. Our brain is tricking us. The brain is the magician's confederate. And indeed, it is not just the way that you perceive magic that is different from the magic that is happening on stage, but later on, the way that you think about what has happened, the way that you remember the magic is going to be very different. And, uh, and this is why oftentimes in our collaborations with magicians and 
we, we talk to public audiences and people will often come to us and, and ask, well, I saw this magic trick and it was amazing and the magician did this and did that and how did that happen? And, uh, and we'll often have to tell this person, well, it would be even if we wanted to reveal magic secrets, which is not the point of the science, but even if we were trying to do that, it would be almost impossible to reconstruct this trick based on the information that you're providing because what you remember and what happened can be very different experiences. Yeah, I think, uh, can you hear me? Um, I think what you're seeing is a multitasking thing, which is really a fantasy. Uh, Alain is focusing your attention in a certain way. So it's a matter of taking uh, your free-floating interest and whatnot and focusing it on what he wants you to focus on so that you don't follow exactly what, what he's carrying out. Um, it's a matter of an illusion which can slip also into a delusion. I mean, if, if I take, a, take my comb and, and drop and, and let go of it, it's going to fall to the floor. But if it goes up and touches the ceiling, then uh, you're going to say, well, that's not a violation of the law of gravity. It's a trick. But suppose someone else saw that happen and said, well, no, I, I, I saw it. It actually went up to the ceiling. And I know that's true because I was there and I witnessed it. Now, that's an example of an illusion starting to drift on into delusional sorts of things. Um, and that's, of course, a, a, an interface that I'm very interested in because uh, to take an example is the uh, research of uh, uh, Dan Tyrone who showed that uh, if a person is working with a uh, computer screen that's sort of tracking something and he can see his hands in the computer screen too, it's, the pictures of it. Well, in 20% of the cases, it's not his hands, it's somebody else's hands. So instead of it moving the way it's supposed to, and as he's willing it to move, it's moving some other way. So as a result, the subject performs very poorly, and the explanation that comes out from perfectly normal people is, well, I wanted it to go to the right, but my hand wanted it to go to the left, um, which, of course, is a delusional statement. Um, most people say, uh, after this example, this particular uh, experiment, uh, people said, well, I don't know how it happened, but I've got other things to think about. What <laughs> drifts it into a delusional thing is to be convinced of something that you know that your intelligence and your background uh, knows can't happen, but assuming that it has, like with the dropping of the cone. We know that this is something that goes up to the ceiling, that it's uh, defying uh, gravity and defying our knowledge. So what, what Alain is doing is, is sort of playing with our expectations of things, like with the, with, with the women who, uh, I mean, I thought that was so great. I mean, just, just one person's being touched, but the other one is uh, responding to the same sort of uh, thing. And I, I don't know how to explain that. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so th these are my initial thoughts about uh, I think that, um, well, it's funny because Richard had just recently published an article that uh, talked a little bit about the, uh, uh, a, a game that was created by a neuroscientist who basically said that if you put yourself in near darkness in a chair and have another chair in front of you and on that chair is a mirror and you basically stare into that mirror for five full minutes in near darkness that your face will start to contort and all sorts of crazy delusions and stuff take place. Um, I, uh, I, I, I posted this to a group that, uh, of, of people who do what I do and, uh, and, and came up, it basically a lot, of, a lot of responses came out and it's interesting because people who, are, who consider themselves shaman or, or uh, magicians who are uh, more interested in the history of magic going back to why people actually believe or want to believe in magic, um, they'll look at something like that. I mean, the scientists will look at a demonstration like that and say, wow, they're actually deluding their, themselves into believing these things take place. Well, what a shaman would do is they would look at that and say, that is telling us a message that is our subconscious essentially telling us something that is based on what we're feeling inside and that we can use that information that is a delusion, if you will, to bring forth 
some reality that is within ourselves that will improve ourselves or, or improve, our, improve our lives in some way. And I think that that's really interesting because as far as a, being a magician or being a, a mentalist or a mind guy in, in doing this stuff, I feel, that, uh, I feel that the most interesting thing is not necessarily how it's done, but why is it done and, and what does it ultimately do. It's not necessarily the fact that there's an illusion because as was mentioned by Steve, it's all an illusion. Every single thing that we experience is an illusion. So the question is, how do we take the illusion and make it a part of our reality? I think that uh, the, the comments that, uh, that Alan just made um, raise an interesting question, which is the connection between perception and belief. And we have misperceptions and um, experience illusions all the time. But uh, how do we go, taking the example that, uh, of the disillusion in front of the mirror, which we, we also feature in a, in a past illusion column in Scientific American. So what, uh, what happens from a perceptual standpoint in this illusion is that uh, you're looking at yourself in the dark, and there is very sparse visual information. And as, as we mentioned previously, uh, you don't have a lot of information to begin with, plus when you stare at something for a prolonged period of time, what happens is that you minimize your eye movements, so you receive even less information and things adapt. It just, that's just like a, when you have your glasses on and you're looking all over the house for them and you don't notice that you're wearing them anymore, it's because your neurons have adapted. The same thing happens to our visual system when we stare at something for a while. So we have all of these holes in information and the brain fills it in with uh, the information that is still present and our memories and our expectations. But here is where the narrative then overtakes the, the explanation. And as perceptual scientists, we may be thinking, okay, well, the brain is filling in gaps. We know this is a common phenomenon. But if you have, um, say that uh, you believe in past lives or uh, that's a common experience. When you're seeing your own face in the mirror, we'll, you'll often see your features morph into, a f into the face of somebody in your family who died a long time ago. Bloody and Mary. And uh, exactly. And you, you, you may feel that this is kind of a, it, it feels like kind of a transcendent experience. The, of course, the actual explanation is that we do look like our own dead relatives, so it's no wonder <laughs> that, uh, that this person kind of looks, looks like us. There's an article in today's New York Times, did you see it was about uh, a little bit of mag magician in all of us, and it had to do with people with darts, and they, they could be throwing darts at the face of a baby, a picture, uh, or they could be throwing at a figure, and it showed they made many more errors when they had the, the face of the baby, because the unconscious level, we don't distinguish between the real thing and just the representation of it. So you should be able to say, what difference does it make? This isn't a baby. This is just a picture of a baby. I'll throw the dart right into the nose. Or the eye. <laughs> it. But I think this also plays into the, the, the narrative that I, uh, issue that I was going for. Like what we tend to do with a magic show and with life is we tend to make up stories. And I think that it is no coincidence. And maybe Alan could comment on this as well. Why is it that magic tricks, the, the magician is not just showing sleight of hand or is just uh, giving us information in a, in a mentalism show, but uh, there is a wider framework in which there is a story, there is something beyond the specific actions that is taking place. Yeah. And I think that leads to the, to the belief that is critical to the magic experience. Now, the, the, the truth of the matter is that I believe that magic most people, when they experience a magic show, they're not actually believing that they're experiencing real magic. Um, most magicians in today's you know, culture are going to essentially try to do the most amazing things that's going to fool every single aspect of your senses and you're not going to have any idea how it's done. And at the same time, they're going to do it in such a way that you are going to feel like you are completely entertained, you had no idea how it worked, but you don't want to know how it worked because it was just so amazing and you were so entertained that it doesn't matter whether it was real magic or whether it was a special effect. You were entertained and you were moved by the experience. What I think is interesting about mentalism is that mentalism is sort of like that, that kind of outlaw domain of magic in which you, you've got people who really, who, who, have, who will take aspects of what we instinctively believe are 
our uh, magical notions or magical thinking that we might actually have within ourselves, superstitions that we might have, notions of, uh, of, of how we use our minds in real life. A lot of times hypnosis, hypnosis is, a real, is a real thing. I mean, it's something that people use to change patterns in their, in, in their minds, and it's, a, and, and it's the same process that makes you feel like you're glued to your chair and can't get up, or that you are, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're feeling like uh, an, an you know, going into a past life and seeing who you were before you were born. Um, all of those things are really interesting because it really does, to me, because it really does kind of hearken to this notion, you know, is, is, that, something that, uh, is that something that we are deceiving ourselves into believing, or is this some aspect of our mind that we are somehow drumming up because, I mean, hip, you know, it's funny because when you, when you talk to a hypnotist, they don't care. They'll do past, re if you talk to any hypnotist, they do past life re regressions. All of them learn it and all of them do it, but none of them care whether or not it's real. They just know that it's going to help you and therefore they do it because it's, a, it's something that actually helps you. But it's interesting that they do it at all because it is a process that really you know, makes you feel really happened to yourself and, and, and you, end up, uh, you end up not knowing whether or not you, know, you were that Middle Eastern boy looking in the water, and you know, somewhere, some other, in some other time and place. You know, I think that I it's just. Remember the time I, I hypnotized a patient who come into my office with neck pain, and very severe neck pain. I did hypnosis, what they call an induction technique, similar to yours, getting on an elevator and riding, uh, in, this, in this case, down to the lower floor and leaving all your pain there, and then riding up and so forth. So she left the office and she went out to the waiting room and the patients were like freaked out by it. This woman had this collar on when she came in. Now she's all cured, moving around and all this. So she went back to see her orthopedic surgeon who uh, also was impressed how well she did. But see, I had forgotten something. I had forgotten to take her out of hypnosis. And she left. So you did. Remember, there, you said to both of them, well now, you know, get back into that and we'll run. I didn't have time for that. <laughs> that call from the orthopedic surgeon. He said, well, I really didn't think that woman's going to be free of that neck pain, and I have to admit she is. He said, and you did it. He said, but when I asked her what happened, she said that you and she went out into the hallway and got on the elevator and rode up and down in the apartment building. <laughs> <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> you don't do it right. <laughs> did she think she was a chicken? <laughs> So something, something else that I, I think it would be interesting to, to discuss is about um, how emotions play into the whole experience of magic. And you, you, you uh, Alain, touched a little bit upon this when you said that um, at some point the audience stops wondering and just wants to enjoy the magic. And, uh, and I think that uh, uh, something that we have uh, noticed and that, that actually magicians have uh, have brought to our attention is the feeling that of empathy that the magician wants to generate with the audience that, uh, of course, you want to go to a show and you want to be entertained by a, by a nice person. But uh, having this type of empathy with the audience is also to the magician's benefit in that if the public wants the magician to succeed, the show is going to be much more effective than if the audience is just trying to look behind the, every magic trick and see what the method might be. And, that, and that's especially critical, I think, with the selection of subjects for a hypnosis trick, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And especially when you've got two different people on stage and one's a skeptic and one isn't, right? And you choose which one that you're going to tap and which one you're not going to tap based yes. on how you're perceiving them in the audience ahead of time, right? Um, well, basic, uh you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm actually in the process of writing my own book right now. It will be uh, hopefully released before the end of the year. I'm really close to the end. It was supposed to be released before now. But, uh, but the, uh, the end of, basically, it's, inter it's an interesting process because I wanted to write a book for, I, I, I've lived my entire life essentially writing for mentalists and magicians and hypnotists and uh, and you know I make a living essentially doing shows and occasionally I write secrets up and they get uh, 
put out into the world that way. But uh, recently I've decided that I'm going to just try to write a book for the main public and what would I do to be able to really, really give people a feeling as to what this stuff that I do actually is. You know, how can I do it in such a way that I'm actually being completely honest and at the same time I'm being able to deliver the message that I really want to deliver, which is that magic is real and it's as real as we want to make it ultimately. Um, so, so, it's a, so it's an interesting process because, you know, the way I decided to undergo it was I started to open the book with uh, just a series of easy to learn mentalism tricks that will allow you to fool your colleagues and friends and associates and amaze people uh, without too much uh, practice. And, so, um, and so, so I do that so that I can get everybody in. And, uh, and also I have a fan base that actually does like to, to read that stuff that I write. But then after that, my, again, my interest is not really so much how it's done and the fact that it can entertain people, but what it can do that's beyond just the entertainment factor. And so I, I kind of decided to take it into, a, into essentially a strange but true uh, paranormal type of book, you know? So, so I'll, I'll, now when I say paranormal, I don't mean like the 70s style of paranormal where I'm talking about Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster and stuff, but rather I really wanted to touch upon things that were happening now that were strange but true. And so one of the things that I really wanted to focus on was the strange but true aspects of the placebo effect. And I, I did a lot of research and I tried to understand and wrap my head around, you know, what is it about the placebo effect that makes it so compelling? The fact that we don't have to do anything. Well, what I realized is that it's a ritual that ultimately does it. Basically, you can be told that what you're being that what you're being given is a placebo and yet by simply being said by simply being told just take the pill it's a sugar pill it's a placebo but it'll work they say that it'll work and it'll work and it's strange because it's what i think it is it's part of part of it is the ritual of going through the process it's not really necessarily what's in the pill it's the ritual of yourself of, of yourself going through this motion of self-healing every single day and concentrating on that little moment. And what that does is it, uh, pardon my expression, homeopathic, homeopathically sort of, uh, sort of generates something within your mind that allows yourself to cure yourself. Now, I'm not saying that this happens with every single thing that, in the illness that's out there, but I think that it's very, very interesting that it even happens in things like knee surgery. You know, I think that uh, the placebo effect is fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think that the Maharishi effect, the thing that the, that, that the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi uh, uh, and the transcendental meditation uh, people do is really fascinating. Now, the skeptical side is that they're claiming to be able to heal diseases, they're claiming to be able to start world peace, and they're, starting, they're, they're claiming to be able to reduce crime in, in violent cities. I mean, it feels like you're being sold a utopian dream. But at the same time, if you look at the data as to what they did and you try to look at just the, the overall story of what took place in order for all of that crazy stuff to happen, you know, I mean, these are people who believe on some level that they can levitate or move through space. These are, these are people who believe that they can reduce crime in cities and have done so in, you know, have, have studies that they have, have, have done themselves that they've done in like probably hundreds of cities by now. And, um, and they believe that they can do it. What, what I think is really interesting is that is there's, a very, there's a large group of skeptical people and, and rational people who will say there's absolutely no way that that could possibly be done using just a bunch of people who meditate. You know, I mean, how can that possibly be? And at the same time, you know, it's kind of interesting. And then you've got the thing with the, with the secret and the, laws of, the law of attraction and what that can potentially do. You know, it's very interesting because there's every reason to believe that, there, that there, that could not happen. And yet, I have to say, you know, as an artist, I live off of the law of attraction. I live <laughs> that world. I literally am constantly, month after month, wishing that something will happen to me and then having something happen to me that I'm wishing for. It's a very strange thing, but it happens to me enough that I, that I have to say that there's something really interesting going on. Now, I don't know whether or not it's sci it can be scientifically proven or if it's even science, but what I find, it, what I find is interesting is that, that we can think these things and then when they happen, it's just a beautiful thing. And, uh, and, and then I have to say to myself, do I want to live a life in which I am constantly skeptical of those magical things that happen in my life 
throughout, or do I want to live in a life in which everything is enchanting around me and I get to actually experience magic on a regular everyday level? And I think that, so from that standpoint, I mean, you know, magicians can be delusional, but at the same time, I think it's a really happy place to be, so. <laughs> <laughs> What you look for in a volunteer, in other words, let's say you say, I'll get a volunteer, eight people put up their hand. I mean, is it just random or do you have some? Um, yeah, I, I, as far as choosing volunteers, yeah. I, I'd say that with, with the world of magic and with the world of you know, doing things on stage to amaze people, rapport is extremely important. And so if you're going to choose people that or, you know, if you're, if you're going to look at someone and somebody's like this looking at you, you know, the idea is you don't want to, like, choose those particular people. You really want to <laughs> develop an open line of communication. And so, you know, one of the things that I end in my book, so the book that I have begins with you learning simple tricks, but then at the very end, it basic, what I wanted to do was I wanted to teach elements of like, uh, you know, how to get into your subconscious, like using the pendulum and using, uh, using things that are like oracular tools to be able to potentially help yourself in some, in some therapeutic way. Um, and or just see if there is some kind of amazing possibility within your mind that can be proven to you in some way. And it's interesting because there are a bunch of guys out there that are really working on this on a regular basis. And one of the one one of my friends who I'm going to introduce in the book is actually uh, he he actually doesn't believe in neuro linguistic programming and believes that it's a complete pseudo scientist, like probably many of you believe as well. But the truth of the matter is is that he he takes this idea of anchoring and he uses it in such an efficient way that you are literally becoming hypnotized without you even realizing it. You're starting, it starts with curiosity and it ends with you not being able to pull your hand off the table and you're just like, what? I mean, it's really kind of strange because he does it almost, he does it imperceptibly and he does it without you actually knowing that it's going to happen until he brings it up and he does it very gently. It's not like a, it's not an authoritative approach. It's a very permissive, it's a, it's like a very permissive, exactly. <laughs> He'd say things like, uh, you don't have to do anything. In fact, you don't even have to listen to my voice. And as soon as that negative goes into the con subconscious, I mean, then they really are like, <coughs> listening to everything he says. So he neutralizes all this critical. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think uh, it's time that the audience has been wonderful, very patient. Maybe we'll give them a, an opportunity. There are microphones on two sides, and because we are videoing this, we do want to pick up the sound, so we welcome your, your questions. If you would identify yourself by name and affiliation, I think it would be useful, and if it's directed to a particular person, maybe let him or her know at the beginning. Please. Uh, my name is Lillian Inkster, and I work for the National Center for Health Statistics, and so I'm not generally a <clears throat> big believer in all types of illusion, but I'm very interested by your, your stories and your, and your ideas and your theories of how this all works. And of course, as you mentioned, the placebo effect, and there's also even more dramatic, the nocebo effect, which you're aware of. And in law enforcement, there are all the issues that police will tell you that no two witnesses will describe the same event, even though they're both standing side by side. So we know those examples. But what interested me was when you were talking about how much of what we perceive is because our brain sort of fills in the blanks. And that made me wonder, and I'd like to hear some conversation from all of you, about whether that has a lot to do with why young children are so creative, because they don't have much in the way of expectations. And so their brain actually sees more. Mm -hmm. They're not filling in the blanks because they don't have expectations to fill it in with and whether or not that creativity that may be present, at least in some adults, is because they've learned somehow to rein in their expectations and they try not to fill in the blanks, maybe consciously or subconsciously, or maybe you have some other theories as to what makes a person creative, why is it all children tend to be, but then as we get older, especially those of us with a reputed high IQ or we have years and years of education, we have so much expectation to fill in the blanks that we lose our creativity entirely. So just a thought, if you could speculate on that. 
For what children, uh, what, what they have, especially young children up to the ages of three, four, five even, uh, they have enormous neural plasticity compared to adults and even younger children. They have what we call uh, critical periods, and those are periods in the development of, of the brain where you, your capacity for learning is incredible, and that's why we are all born with the ability to learn any language, but what happens in the first few months and years of our life is that as we get exposed to the environment, we lose a lot of our connections, and we basically set these neural pathways in a way that after we grow up, it becomes difficult to learn new information and diverge from that. So it's not that children do not fill in the gaps. I mean, neurally they do, and they have a blind spot in their visual system, just like we all do, and this gets filled in just as well. But um, if, if, I, if, I may, if I may finish my, my sentence, uh, just, just a second, if I can recover my, my line of thought. So, so, so with children, they, um, they're learning about the world, and you are correct. So they have critical periods, and that uh, their brains are much more flexible. But you are also right in that uh, they don't have strong expectations about reality. And that's why for a child, a microwave, uh, being able, you, you put a glass of milk in the microwave and it comes out hot, that can be just as magical as the best mentalism <laughs> trick. And in fact, uh, uh, a lot of magicians have told us that magic is not really a good show for children. Be below the age of five, children are not going to, to go for a magic show. They're not going to appreciate it. And this is in part due to the fact that they don't have strong expectations. Well, I was just going to say that you, part of becoming adult is to pick up what they call scripts. So there's so many different scripts, you know, how you behave when you go to a restaurant, how you behave when you're at a ball game and all this. And of course, the, these scripts are what magicians and mentalists take advantage of, that you expect certain things, that you think that things are going to be, and that's why you can, you can be fooled. Uh, so that's the adult who has, as a result of, uh, expectations. I mean, magic is always about you know, disconfirming expectations. So we are, as a creatures, we are very much taken up with explanations and trying to get explanations for things. In many cases, that the explanation is leading us down the wrong path. So the magicians inherently have been mentalists, have known that there's ways of taking this expectation and playing with it so that they can confound it. I'd like to, to just make a demonstration for, for you all that you can take to your next cocktail party. So put out your, your thumbs, and straighten your arms with your elbows straight, and put your thumbs together, and put your two index fingers up and kind of the double loser sign here, okay? So now with your arm, or again, your elbows straight, your elbows have to be straight, look, thumbs close up. your left eye and look at your left fingertip, and you'll see your right fingertip disappear, okay? And if it doesn't disappear, just move it around like this a little bit until it disappears, and it goes into the blind spot of your right eye, okay? Now what's interesting about that is you can see what's behind your fingertip that's missing, right? Right? Yeah. Right. So do you have x-ray vision in your blind <laughs> spot, or are you blind in your blind spot, right? You're blind in your blind spot, but you can still see what's behind your finger that's gone because your brain is taking the information from around the blind spot and filling it in, but it doesn't you do that that much with your finger, so it doesn't have the algorithm by which to replace your finger with that, okay? And so this is an example of how you're taking a set of rules and filling in information that's never been there. If you close one eye, you have a big black spot in your vision, very close to the center that you've never seen. Many of you have never experienced your blind spot before to right now, right? and yet you've constantly been blind there. You've never had stereo vision there, ever, right? And yet, this is evidently happening to you all the time, right near where you actually see. And so this is an example of where you have learned to actually fill things in, uh, in, in, a, in a blank in your vision. There is another um, thing that happens in children that is different from adults and that's how they focus attention. And this is actually interesting that about magicians and neuroscientists, uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, this has been done in, independent, in an independent way, but both communities use the metaphor of the spotlight of attention, meaning that attention works like a spotlight in which you focus on something and the rest remains 
dark. And now we know actually uh, from in part from our own research that what the brain is doing when you attend to something is it suppresses information everywhere else. Now this dynamic enhancement and suppression of attention, the spotlight of attention, is not very strong in children. And what the, th the current thinking in neuroscience is, is that children, rather than having a spotlight of attention, they have kind of a lantern that is more diffuse and illuminates a wider region with, with, with less suppression. So that's another way in which a children may be able to be more flexible as they analyze the environment and also why children are not the best subjects in magic shows. Because magicians can't control their attention as well and <laughs> therefore they have a gain of function for seeing the method. They're nobody nobody can. Not just <laughs> Parents neither. <laughs> okay, one of our volunteers has now come to the microphone. Um, I'm Heather Dean from the National Science Foundation. I'm a neuroscientist by training. And I think you said we could ask for, ex for, uh, we could ask for explanations. I was wondering about the explanation for what happened on stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, I'll say this. Basically, what, what a mentalist does, okay, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna try to approach it from a very uh, objective viewpoint. Um, what, a, what a mentalist is particularly interested in doing is, is showing you aspects of how the mind can potentially work and, uh, and, and, how to, uh, and how to basically become fascinated in our minds and how our minds and the powers that we don't necessarily know our minds actually have. Um, so what, what mentalism really comes from, strangely, is the realm of mystery arts, which we'll call, um, I guess, really kind of spiritualism, early 18th century, 19th century spiritualism, um, in which they, uh, the, the people would actually try to communicate with the dead. They would try to essentially um, uh, cr put yourself in a situation like, for instance, seances. The room is very, very dark. There's lots of different things that can happen, even if there is no uh, chicanery per se within the act of doing a seance, something will happen and something really interesting takes place. So, so what, uh, what mentalism really was, was in my personal theory, is that uh, is, it was sort of a way for people who actually believed in mysterious things to theatrically present it in a way that would allow them to sell tickets so that people could come and see their performances and stuff, and yet at the same time be able to deliver these representations of these amazing aspects of, of, of our mind and the world's beyond. Um, so some of it was theatrical, and some of it uh, kind of lends itself into going into the, 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 the real directions. So when it comes to like hypnosis, when it comes to, um, when it comes to suggestion, when it comes to um, people being placed in, uh, in, in a, in a uh, condition that allows them to expect one thing or another. It, it basically, uh, you end up in a situation where you can essentially feel, feel that what's going on is actually a reality. Now, it's funny because last night I was talking to a friend of mine. I said, I said so, so tomorrow night I'm going to try something for the very, very first time that will involve uh, pareidolia, which is basically the act of trying to get this rhythm going with your pulse. And I said, so either it's going to be very, very interesting or it's going to really, really suck. And so, <laughs> and, uh, but, but, I, but, and, and so, but the bottom line is I didn't really know. And what I wanted to do was just essentially try it to see what would actually happen and to, and to, uh, and to experiment. Um, I think that what, what mentalists do more often than not are, is try to experiment with audiences as a whole and try to see whether or not they can kind of get to a point in which they're experiencing something that is not necessarily, that does not necessarily feel like an illusion, but actually feels like something real is taking place in order to, in order to have that real experience. Um, Ultimately, I feel like the goal is to give people that sense of, of, of seeing real magic take place and to really experience something that's fascinating without having the constraints of saying what you're about to see is just a bunch of special effects and, you know, and, and, and whatnot. I think that, uh, I think that 
though, though the disclaimer is always nice, I think that sometimes when it comes to magic or Santa Claus or whatever, you don't need to necessarily give a disclaimer. You just need to just do the effect and let people experience it and let it come down on people. And eventually they kind of, it kind of, it, it, it settles on them in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. And I think that it ends up bringing people forward in themselves better than if they were to even just know what was going on, for to, so, so to speak. Does that make sense to you? Seems like a little bit of a sleight of words, but <laughs> <I'll let it go>. <laughs> <laughs> so, so James Randi uh, put it to us best, Heather, uh, that uh, he, he, in his, when he was a mentalist, he uh, used to do hypnosis as well. And he says that hypnosis is a pact between the uh, performer and the participant. But you can set things up and ask questions in such a way that you always come out on top as a performer, right? So he asked you both whether you felt certain things, right? And you didn't. And, and uh, Chandler, I believe her name was, did. And, but what if you did too? Would that be a bad thing or would that be a good thing? Huh? I can't, I can't. They, they both, both, they both did. did. But one, one of them was actually touched. Well, that's, well, that's right. right. One was actually touched and, and, and one wasn't. But the, the point is that there's ways that you can frame the question so that no matter what the answer, right, you can turn it into an effective trick. Okay? And so that is one of the things that, that magicians do in this type of situation. And I... I, I Right. So in, in, the, in the book test, which by the way, I got to tell you, so when, when he chose, or rather, when I chose the page that I was looking at in my book, it was the first page of chapter nine, which is the explanation that James Randi ah. gives for what a book test is, which is exactly <laughs> what he was doing. Go figure. So, <laughs> gives you Synchronicities abound. <laughs> whether I really chose that page or whether whether someone else on the stage may have chosen <laughs> I didn't, I can assure you that. But it's a, it's a very difficult way to do that trick because using someone else's book is obviously very difficult, right, when you do that kind of trick. And uh, I give, you know, full kudos to, to Alain. For, for, for the book test? This, yeah. this, this, this one we had tonight. The book test he gave tonight? Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, so, we're, we're, we're not here to disclose. Aha. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. I'll give one small hint. I did not hold the book while the pages were being chosen. Okay? I'll just leave it at that. That was some connection. Okay. That's uh, all we, I'm going to say. We have three people standing and to ask questions, and it's only going to work in the time frame as if your questions are quick and the responses are somewhat quick. And maybe we can get those three in, and then we'll break for the reception. This young man over here, please. Uh, I'm Ruben Ascoli. I'm from Frost Middle School. So how would you, like, change, like, how did you twist and bend the spoon without like, <laughs> doing that? <laughs> well, here's, here's, here's the, uh, the truth, is that it's not, it's, it's, it's not a different spoon, it's not a special spoon, and if you were to give me a spoon or a key or something like that, I would be able to still bend it. Um, but uh, but uh, that is actually part of why we call it a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, can, I can add to that without revealing any magic secrets uh, that uh, Alain already mentioned that these are common objects and that in a sense <coughs> makes the magic more powerful because all of us use spoons every day, we use keys every day, and we have, what I will say is that we have certain expectations about our everyday objects and these expectations that we have are not necessarily correct about how these objects work. <laughs> OK, please, sir. Uh, so I'm uh, interested in your name. Uh, oh, my, my name is Ivan Amato, and I run a, a public engagement series in town called DC Science Cafe. Uh, so I'm interested in uh, distortions of time perception. And in particular, I'm thinking about uh, those cases. Maybe some of us have had, had this experience uh, in, in harrowing, perilous, high-tension situations. 
uh, where we uh, report after the fact that it seems like it took a long time. You, you hear this phrase, it's as though it was in slow motion. And then we you know, kind of think back on it, we think we see all kinds of details uh, that we don't see in sort of mu more mundane situations. And I've been uh, reading a couple of different theories. One you might say is realist, where in fact somehow we are ratcheting up our, our, the, the, the frame rate of our minds and others are saying that there's other kinds of more, uh, you know, other explanations uh, perhaps involving memory uh, distortions that are responsible. I would love to hear what uh, all of you think about what's going on in those situations. Well, it's, uh, a good friend of ours, David Eagleman, uh, has done experiments with this. So he's, built, he's had a tower outside of Houston, Texas, where he takes people up the tower and he throws them off. <laughs> <laughs> and they have a watch that they're wearing that is changing in time. And the screen is changing so fast that if you look at it, you can't see it. You can't see the numbers. They're just, it's a flurry and you can't see it. But his theory was that when you throw these people off the tower, their life is going to flash before them and time will slow down. If not then, when, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he throws them off this tower towards a trampoline, obviously, that's going to catch them. It's some sort of thrill ride that they have outside of, of Houston. And the idea is they're going to look at their watch, and if, if their brain is, in fact, clocking up, right? If their brain is going faster, and that's why time seems to slow down, then they'll be able to read the clock and be able to actually determine the number that this was happening at and report it, okay? And what he found was no effect. Okay, so. <laughs> and yet, what I would say that is, that, is that baseball players experience this on a regular basis. I mean, that ball is coming at them at the plate at a, over 100 miles an hour oftentimes. And so, so from the distance that they are, that they are basically in away from the, from the pitcher's mound to the plate, something's coming at you at like a, you know, between 90 and 110 miles an hour. And you've got to essentially react at this very split second moment in order to connect with that ball at that very precise moment. It becomes very paranormal to me because it's sort of like, what are the odds of being able to do that? Golf is another one. It's like, what are the odds of being able to get a hole in one in golf? Something like one out of 40,000, something like that. And yet, uh, you know, uh, and yet there are people who get holes in one from time to time. And I think that that's, I think, yeah. Well, well, what's very interesting is that just in 2009, a woman named Uni Haskell, who was at the age of 65 years old in, uh, in, in St. Petersburg, Florida, on her very first time on a golf range, in her very first professional game, got a, a hole in one. And so it's like her first, her first actual uh, time playing, and she was the first person in history to do it. But at 65 years old, it's pretty good. It gives me hope. I think that one, one related phenomenon to why time slows down in dangerous, life-threatening situations is uh, what we have all experienced, and that uh, I think uh, anybody here over the age of 10 say, uh, when we used to be young children, it would take forever for Christmas to arrive or for our next birthday. It would be like ages and ages and ages. And as we get older, time really seems to really speed up. <laughs> and why does that happen? Well, one, one theory that I have is that uh, it has to do with what's novel. And I think that uh, when you're a child, new things that you haven't experienced happen almost every day, sometimes every hour. So there is a lot to pay attention to, a lot to remember. I think our memories from childhood would take uh, much longer to, to describe for any of us that our memories say from ages uh, 30 to 35, um, in, in, generally. So, so I think that as we get older, things become less novel and days merge into days without not, nothing much interesting happening. So our brain just says, okay, done, I've seen this, no need to record it, no need to store it. But when we get into a life-threatening situation, ooh, that's new. I better pay attention now because my life is in danger. So this is a novel situation that really captures our attention and we're kind of like processing time and processing information again as we, when we were young children and a day would take a month. We're coding it and then reporting it. And when we report it, we recreate the memory. And yes. we give it a length that it didn't have at the time. So although you say, I, I saw the truck coming, and I did this, and I did that, 
there wasn't time enough to do all those things. So mm -hmm. this is a reconstruction from the memory. Yeah. Even the chemicals are being reconstructed, yeah. as you know. From Ab absolutely, and we know from, from neuroscience research that as we recall previous memories, what we do is we take this we recorded memory and as we relive it, we change it. And then we store it again. And the more we access this memory, the more that we're going to change it. So this is actually pretty scary because the memories that are most meaningful in our lives, the memories, the, the, the experiences that we think about most often, those are likely to be the ones that are less accurate because every time we access them, we change them. Okay, one, Gen <laughs> sir, you have the, uh, the floor for the last question. Uh, my name is Peter Michelson. I represent the Spear T Ranch in Montana. It's a Montana cattle ranch, and from my perspective, that's not an illusion. Uh, <coughs> it seems to me that there's a real fine line between a magician and a con artist. And <laughs> the resulting, however, the resulting emotions uh, are quite different to the person who's being entertained by the ma magician. Uh, he's excited, he's interested in, hey, how did he do that? And man, I want to find out how he did it. When you're conned, you feel <laughs> small and, and uh, vulnerable and uh, um, stupid and angry. And, you know, you better not meet the guy again. Hmm. And uh, so I think what I'm saying is, is there is reality in all of this from my point of view, and that's my comment. Well, let me, let me, let me comment on it. So, so, I mean, in terms of like whether you are experiencing illusions uh, all the time or not, it's not that we're not saying that the real world isn't out there, okay? It is. You just never live there. The only place you've lived is inside your brain and interpreting things, and that's why cons and magic can work. I mean, a mentalist is someone who manipulates information, okay, just like a magician is someone who manipulates objects. And a con artist, a pickpocket, one of our, our best friends that we've worked with, Apollo Robbins, he's a pickpocket. Well, that's a magician who's doing it to steal your money and steal your stuff. But a con, a, a con artist is doing the same thing as a mentalist or a magician, but is doing it to steal your stuff in a different way, manipulating you in, in very similar ways, but with a different outcome. And that's why most of the, the people who are in the, the, the skeptics arena, who are leaders in the skeptics arena, who are there for helping people learn how to not believe in fraud, to not believe in hypnotists are gonna cure your cancer, right? The John Edwards out there, right? They're, they're teaching people to, to, to learn that, that this is a magic trick, not and should be for entertainment, not for fraud, okay? They're, they're mostly magicians. They think that this is bad behavior and they don't like to see it. And so it's, you know, it's these people that, that are trying to show you, look, I can do the same thing that that person can do with their mind, but I can do it with, my, with a magic trick. And so you should take that as information about whether this is really happening. And so yes, you should feel bad and you should feel like you've been uh, tricked when someone cons you out of your money, but you, you shouldn't feel stupid because they are using your own mental capabilities against you. And none of these magic tricks would work if your attentional systems didn't work very well, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's very important to take Of course, on. that's the underlying uh, theory of advertising, is it not? Indeed, you know, it's <laughs> funny because last night I was reading this book on ninjutsu, and one of the things that, uh, that it mentioned was it said, it, said, it, said, it said, have faith and trust in your tricks more than your courage and bravery. And I think that that is really interesting because it really makes you realize just how important those tricks actually are in your own, you know, the, the tricks that you have as an arsenal for yourselves, uh, whether you're a magician or not. And that brings me to the stigma of what I believe magicians actually have with regards to con artists. I think that con artists exist in all walks of life. And I think that wherever you go, you're gonna meet con artists. You're gonna meet con artists that are doctors, you're gonna meet con artists that are lawyers, you're gonna meet con artists everywhere. And unfortunately, magicians have this awful stigma of being called con artists because they just wanna entertain people by showing you that you can, you, you, you can be entertained by, uh, by a, a, a deception of your perceptions. But I think, that, uh, I think that what a magician does more than anything is just 
illustrate to people that that indeed can happen. And I think what a mentalist does is illustrate to you that although that can happen, you can also look at it in a good way. But, uh, but as far as the con artists go, I admit that you know, there's definitely going to be some people that are, that are uh, not people I'd want to hang out with in this industry that I'm in. But, but, there are, but there are definitely going to be those same people in every walks of life, and you therefore need to watch out for that wherever you go and constantly be vigilant and constantly be aware within your mind as to what is real and how you create your own reality for yourself. And spe speaking, speaking of what is real, that's our reception. We have food and drink, but I before you go, join me in thanking you all.